Hello, and welcome to episode three of the Unanimity Podcast, where thoughts matter. August 16th, 2024, I'm Mark Thornton at the Mises Institute. Today, I'm celebrating birthdays. We will also be celebrating all those who have come before us and the gratitude we should have for all they have given us, including the world around us and everything that is in our hearts. The topic of this episode is births and deaths, which in the cold world of social statistics generates population counts, with the birth-death ratio giving rise to how much population is expanding or contracting over a period of time. This is the first topic of demography, the study of people, something I thoroughly enjoy and everyone thinks it's important. Economics is just the scientific angle on why we see certain patterns of human behavior, including population. Population is an amazing subject and almost entirely pleasing. Step back and imagine yourself as a disinterested scientist. You are trying to grow gold or diamonds in a test tube of seawater, and it actually happens. Or you are a biological scientist and you get stem cells or even cancer cells to proliferate in an experiment in your lab for the first time. It's a eureka moment. The long view of human population history is a similarly amazing experience. It is a pity that most of our minds are often still filled with a different and dark view of population. In fact, in the 1970s, most people were more worried about the so-called population bomb than nuclear war destroying humanity. I'm afraid that economists are much to blame for this dark story, although it has also been peddled by school teachers and college professors and other scaremongers at large for at least two centuries. There are indeed legitimate population-related problems that we need to get solving right away today. But first, we need to know what they are and what caused them. Before we can do that, we need to know what causes population to increase or decrease and whether or not that is a good thing from a more or less objective human point of view. Recapping world population We have estimates which are based on sophisticated guesswork, which will hopefully improve with more research over time. The experts think the following. Humans emerged as a recognizable species with a population estimated to be about 15,000 in Africa around 70,000 years B.C., it would be difficult to recognize the differences between these humans and similar animal species. Then there is a huge gap in time in the guesswork, as primitive society is said to have begun around 10,000 years ago, with the human population estimated to be 4 million as humans migrated broadly around the globe. The population then stays in a lull between 4 to 5 million for the next 5,000 years. As human society started, developed, and spread, the population began to roughly double every 1,000 years and stood about 200 million around the time of Jesus. It was during this long period that human developments started to take place, like language, law, and religion, settlements, agriculture, letters, numbers, the use of money, the invention of the wheel, etc. Then there is a better known, but more erratic, but solid upward trend of population growth to a half a billion people reached sometime in the 1500s. It is at this time, known as the early modern era, and especially the later Industrial Revolution, that population growth rates take off on a sustained basis and eventually go parabolic, doubling to a billion before 1800, 2 billion in the early 1900s, 3 billion before 1960, and today there are over 8 billion people. 
these numbers scare me a little because I can't imagine throwing a party for more than three or 400 people. And I've never even lived in a city with much more than 50,000 people. However, even with that enormous growth, population density ranks as very high only in Southern Asia and in small parts of Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. In fact, some of the most highly densely populated places on the planet, think in terms of city-states, are also some of the most desirable places to live on Earth. The world population is expected to continue to grow for several more decades, eventually to level off, and then even possibly decline. We want a theory to explain this pattern, explain the population problems that loom before us, and what actions we might take to deal with those problems. First, we want to explain the dark theory of population propagated by early economists from England that are wrong, but continue to imprison our thoughts and are capable of generating hysteria. The Malthusian Population Doctrine. Thomas Robert Malthus. 1766 to 1834, was an English Protestant cleric and writer on political economy. He was born into a family that sold drugs and concoctions to the royal families of King George I, II, and III. Malthus is considered a negative reaction to the so-called utopian writers who believed in the possibility of the continual improvement of man. He wrote the infamous book of six editions, first published in 1798, titled An Essay on the Principle of Population. In it, he created what has become known as the Malthusian Population Principle, or Population Trap and it is associated with catastrophe and population collapse. Looking backward in history, Malthus hypothesized that human population would otherwise increase at a geometric pace, that is, 1 to 2 to 4 to 8, 16, etc., while food production could only increase at an arithmetic pace, that is, 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, 5, etc. This leads to the seemingly obvious conclusion that in the absence of a mechanism to restrain population or accelerate production, that some sort of Malthusian catastrophe leading to widespread premature death would inevitably ensue. According to the Reverend Mathis, if the subsistence for men that the earth affords was to be increased every 25 years by a quantity equal to what the whole world at present produces, that is, double the natural productivity of land, this would allow the power of production in the earth to be absolutely unlimited and its ratio of increase much greater than we conceive that any possible exertions of mankind could make it. Yet still the power of population, being a power of a superior order, the increase of the human species can only be kept commensurate to the increase of the means of subsistence by the constant operation of the strong law of necessity acting as a check upon the greater power. What Malthus conveyed to his readers was that nature's bounty, what we can hope to harvest for our sustenance and maintenance, is greatly limited and would be quickly overtaken by our natural proclivity for having sex. While we know about condoms and fertilizers now, Malthus may not have known much about the nascent efforts of birth control of his time, and he may not have been impressed enough with the British agricultural revolution before and during his own life. Not surprisingly, but still nonetheless incorrect, 
Malthus's views on population were actually linked with economics being referred to as the dismal science. That's not true, and I hope to do a special episode of that of the podcast. Charles Dickens, who had some obvious Malthusian concerns, scorned and immortalized Malthus's ideas into the words of Ebenezer Scrooge in A Christmas Carol. When Scrooge famously refused to donate to the poor, he exclaimed, if they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus population. Very much related to this population issue is the classical economic thought in England was the iron law of wages. According to this economic doctrine of those times, if the purchasing power of a laborer's wages were to ever increase, population would subsequently increase to drive down wages to the subsistence level, keeping the population of the common man on the edge of survival. Now, to be fair, if you only looked backward in time, Malthus would have found the preponderance of evidence in favor of his hypothesis. Plagues and pestilence were a regular occurrence in history. The problem seemed to be getting worse for two reasons related to the relatively new phenomenon then of cities. First, prior and during Malthus's time, city life was becoming more popular and people were moving from rural to urban areas, which probably made it seem like the population was increasing very rapidly. Disease and food shortages would also seem more severe in cities. Second, the nature of cities was trade, so that the spread of disease was increased, at least until the impact of immunity took hold or precautions were discovered. So on the one hand, Malthus, who was widely traveled, lived most of his life just outside of London, one of the largest and fastest growing cities in the world. Additionally, the British were often engaged in war with other countries, increasing taxes on the people, borrowing huge sums of money, inflating the money supply, all of which impoverished the working class. So whether you look back in history or looked around the world that Malthus himself could see, the specter of poverty, overpopulation, and mass death was there. We, on the other hand, have no such excuses. Modern times mean that we have a clear picture of what has been happening. We know that the population has increased rapidly, extraordinarily. We know that instead of the iron law of wages, that incomes and the standard of living have risen enormously. Low-income households in the developed world economies of today have higher standards of living and longer lifespans than the royalty of Malthus' time. The former population basket cases, India and China, have thrown off socialism and communism, largely spurring the one billion-plus people out of extreme poverty. We also should be aware that entrepreneurs and scientists are constantly fighting against Malthusian notions in order to line their own pockets with profits and gain prestige of the good type. The Malthusians were extremely influential when I was growing up in the 1970s. They made horrifying predictions of human devastation and calamity resulting from increasing population. All their predictions failed to materialize, but China did adopt the one-child policy, and the hysteria of the time permanently scarred people's psyche with respect to population. I did a separate, short, Minor Issues podcast episode on the hysteria about population in the 1970s. A similar thing happened in 1973 when many people around the world seemingly randomly developed a fear of flying, with many people refused to fly in planes for years to come or the rest of their lives. 
It turns out that 1973 was the peak year for airplane hijacking, hostage taking, and the infamous South American airplane crash where the survivors resorted to cannibalism. Despite the obvious temporal sequence of events, many aerophobic people continued to refuse to fly despite increasingly safer conditions and were even mostly unaware of the cause of their aerophobia. The hysteria over overpopulation, or Malthusiaphobia, has morphed in recent decades into global warming hysteria and now climate change hysteria. Whether or not you are a true believer, it is easy to see how the two agendas are related. The agenda has no way to actually control weather or climate, etc., but what they seek to control is food production, energy use, land use, etc., based on the claim that such things will fix the climate and the environment. So I'm not here to argue this point, but the hypothesis connecting these policies to a problem is, in my mind, both highly tenuous and highly debatable. My bet is that this is a political scam, but I'm an economist, so I will argue a different point here. Restricting resources via government edict means less food, energy, clothing, housing, etc. This means impoverishment for all, except the very rich, less population, and in lesser developed countries, it means unnecessary death. Population is a positive good for society. Instead of a threat of catastrophe, population growth is likely a good sign for society that the right policy system is in place for human thriving. First, people have a taste or tendency to be attracted to other people. We benefit from larger populations. We may say that we like wild open spaces and we hate traffic congestion, but in actual fact, People are attracted to each other geographically for a variety of reasons, and many of those reasons are economic. As a market grows in population, the economic pie grows and the slices get bigger. There is also an overriding tendency for jobs to get narrower, more refined, more technical, more creative, and often more rewarding as markets and the division of labor expand. As work becomes more refined and detailed, professions emerge and subdisciplines emerge. Medical doctoring was once done by jacks of all trades, only to become specialists, then professionals, then surgeons, gynecologists, etc. Economics was once done by general philosophers like Aristotle, then specialist philosophers like Adam Smith, then specialist like Alfred Marshall, and then specialized economists like Anna Schwartz, who did path-breaking research on monetary history. We clearly like all this specialization and the competition that ensues. Most professions, from scientists to chefs, actors, teachers, musicians, accountants, professional sports, all have a very large number of participants and wannabes. They also have their megastars and heroes, those that rise to the top and earn huge incomes compared to the rest. As consumers, we love this whether we follow our favorite golfer or read all the books of our favorite author or podcaster, social media commentator, social influencer. We idolize our favorite singers, actors, anime stars, etc., When Karl Marx complained about the so-called alienation of labor in British factories as being dehumanizing, isolating, and separating us from human essence, he was in conflict with the facts. People were attracted to factory work even back then, which paid good, regular wages compared to the mythical countryside working for a landlord. 
you were also more likely, if you lived in a city, well, you at least had an opportunity to buy a beer or newspaper or some uncommon food item. People have a demonstrated preference for people and like living with more people and benefiting from a large population. The market economy has a demonstrated record of not only being able to support larger and larger numbers of people, but to support them with an ever-increasing standard of living. All politics aside, in the modern capitalistic society, population and population growth or decline is a matter of choice. When resources are privately owned and where capacity, creativity, and innovation is free to create new technologies, we are free to grow population and the standard of living or not. Of course, changes only happen slowly in the short run, but we need not worry about running out of resources, land, people, energy, etc. Ironically, the real issue of population in the future of highly developed economies is declining population, not ever increasing population. This has created a generational problem of temporarily having a larger number of old retired people relative to the size of the young working population. The general population demographic issue the world faces is that as population and the standard of living increased with the spread of capitalism, it has started to reach a plateau of population in some spots as the death rate decreased first followed by the birth rate, resulting in lower population growth and even decline, but most importantly, a demographic bulge of aging population. In an advancing capitalist system, of course, we want to avoid death and increase lifespan. And now we can more accurately decrease birth in response to higher wage rates and other activities and opportunities than raising children. Demographers will tell you that the imbalances that we're currently dealing with and will deal with were exasperated by things like world wars and medical and agricultural technologies imported into lesser developed countries with large government subsidies. However, normally such aging problems can be dealt with by increasing wealth, advances in technology, and normal immigration patterns over time. Nevertheless, there are at least three government policy problems that could push these demographic issues into the realm of crisis proportion. The first policy issue is the long isolation regime in Japan which has created the most intense current aging population problem. Japan also has the largest government debt relative to GDP of any country. Yes, government bonds can be viewed as someone's wealth, but the issue here is who will be around to pay the taxes to pay off all these bonds. The second and most noteworthy policy issue is China's famous one-child policy, which has created a huge aging population cliff in its population demographics, the realization of which forced that country to overturn the policy, but of course that does not immediately eliminate the problem. The third and most insidious policy is the last half century of fiat monetary policy in the advanced world economies a debauched monetary system where governments can simply print money is a great deterrent towards building families for the future, especially among the part of the demographics, young working class families, most likely to result in high birth rates. This may also be the reason why this demographic group is most attracted to cryptocurrencies. These are some of the most important known problems that the world faces. The U.S. actually has similar demographic issues, 
but also has a high rate of immigration of young people. These problems are really the opposite of the Malthusian problem. The global climate change agenda policies actually only make these problems worse, not better. The good news is that capitalistic development produces three key ingredients for resolving such crises, wealth creation, technological improvements, normal migration patterns, both inside and between countries, and of course, just individual decision-making. Policy reforms that enhance individual decision-making and reduce individual dependency will also facilitate resolution. On the other hand, government mandates for chemically made factory produced chicken strips and government bureaucrats trying to prevent cows from pooping and farting will not solve anything. Thank you very much for listening to another episode of the Unanimity Podcast, where people matter too. I'm Mark Thornton at the Mises Institute.